and um, I will call the August meeting of the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise and Workforce Advisory Committee uh, to order. <clears throat> Again, my name is Ashanti Payne. I am the Assistant Director of the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity at the Metropolitan Council. And I would like to, uh, along with uh, my co-chair, uh, welcome uh, DWAC committee members and alternates. Um, and uh, we appreciate your time and taking the time uh, to contribute uh, with us today. Um, <clears throat> the Green Line Extension construction project has reached a big milestone. Uh, the civil contractor will begin turning over some of those completed segments to the systems contractor. And I know David will talk a little bit more about that during his presentation. Um, but this is good prog progress and, and brings us closer uh, to the finish line. Also today, we will be joined by a few representatives from uh, some of the specific union halls. Um, and as we continue our conversations from last month, um, so we, we will welcome them, them and at the appropriate time, give them the chance to introduce themselves uh, as well. Just in terms of a little housekeeping, of course, uh, for virtual meetings, uh, please mute yourself um, if you are not speaking. And if you are having technical issues, let us know in the chat and we'll try to resolve them. Also, please uh, reserve the chat for technical issues. Um, I know I've, I've broken this a couple of times, but um, there are people who are listening in from the public um, via YouTube uh, or other means, and they do not have access to the chat. So uh, uh, please um, only use the chat for uh, technical issues. Um, also close other teleconference applications as we've learned that it improves the meeting audio and visual quality. This meeting is being recorded by the Metropolitan Council. Uh, meeting handouts and presentation are posted on the project website at swlrt.org. And with that, I will turn it over to my co-chair. Thanks, Ashanti. Appreciate appreciate it. And just uh, one thing before I go through the uh, roll call is I just wanted to let folks know that MDHR's new equity and inclusion supervisor, Tyler Bishop, is here on the call, getting a chance to see see how the DWAC meeting goes before he will actually step in as co-chair from MDHR next month. But wanted to give him a chance to actually see the drill before we make him uh, help run the show. So. Well, I think he'll probably have a chance to introduce himself at some point here, but if you want to just introduce yourself briefly now, that'd be fine. Sure. Uh, great to see a lot of familiar faces. My name is Tyler Bishop. I'm the new Equity and Inclusion Supervisor with MDHR, and I'm very excited to work closely with all of you moving forward. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, super pleased to have Tyler on board. So, okay, well, we will just jump through the roll call real quick. Um, I see if I know folks are here, I'll just say, Ashanti, I know you're here. John, I know you're here. I'm here. Elaine is here. Is either Barry Davies or Jenny Winkler here? I'm here. And Dan McConnell is the replacement for Barry Davies. Oh, great. Sorry, didn't have didn't have that on the updated list, Jenny. And Dan McConnell. Great. Thank you. We'll make sure to make make that note. I, I guess I'm working off an old list. And from Hennepin County is either Gilbert or Eric here. Don't see them. Okay. Um, from Association of Women Contractors is Barb Lau or her alternate, Kendra. Looks like I see you here, Kendra. Hi, Kendra. I'm here. Great. Thank you. Um, from Goodwill is Sheila or Christine here today? Oh, this is Sheila. I'm here. Great, thanks, Sheila. People are people are popping up as as they talk. So, just making sure. From hired Julie Brecky or John Clem. I see John. I see you. Is Julie going to be here today? Julie's on vacation, so I'm going to represent hired. Excellent. I'm glad she's taking a vacation. We all should. So. Great. Um, from some of I see, let's see, is Tony or Chris here? 
Looks like a no. Um, Twin Cities Rise is Alex here today. Do you not see Alex? Um, City of Minneapolis. I understand Johnny Burns is has replaced Leslie. Johnny, you here? Or Daniel Peterson? All right, don't see anybody. Um, is Mara here from Higher Minnesota? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. And then um, John O'Fallon or Dave Gorski? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm present. John O'Fallon. Oh, thanks, John. And then from Mindot, um, Mary or Sheila? This is Renee Redunz as an alternate. Oh, great. Thanks, Renee. All right. So that gets gets through our members. So I think that that covers it. All right. So that is the roll call for folks should have received the uh, July 2022 meeting minutes, and they were included in the meeting handouts for review. If you have any edits, if you want to let us know now, otherwise you can also email those to Ashanti and I. Any uh, edits on those July minutes folks wanted to flag? All right, hearing none. Well, if folks decide that they have edits on those, feel free to send those to Ashanti and I, and we will make sure those get made. So I will pass pass it over to the GLE project office for, for updates for, uh, I think David Davies is gonna take that. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your time today. Uh, just as, as I have the last few months, just wanted to run through a little bit of a, a pro brief project update that includes uh, a, a an update of what Ashanti was talking about and that um, the civil contractor has turned over three three segments uh, of the 16 that are kind of the project is divided up into um, and turn that over to the systems contractor. So we have been talking about that. We presented that to our corridor management committee uh, earlier this month. And um, it's it's great news seeing seeing that progress out on the West, being able to show that to the community um so it, it's it's a a good milestone to achieve and to, to to progress forward on as i have in the past i'm just gonna show a few uh project highlights here so jason if you want to start rolling through updates and um you know i apologize we're starting in st louis park i had some slides for the entire corridor and i will make sure we have all of those in the the final um uh presentation that that goes out to members after this um we've got some photos of the entire usually i try to cover the entire alignment um i'm seeing where maybe they're in a few minutes here maybe they're out of order or something but um i'll focus on st louis park in minneapolis today and and we will we can certainly talk about uh other parts uh, at the next meeting um so we've got a lot of work going on the Segments that are being turned over are in the, on on the west side, but certainly work all over the corridor. Uh, this shows the work of the Secant Wall and the, in the Kenilworth corridor and the Kenilworth LRT tunnel. Um, I'll I'll note as as people have probably heard me say before that um, I'm the core I'm the I'm the coordinator that covers Minneapolis as well. So we've been bringing a lot of community members down to see the progress of this work. And it's a extremely opportune time because we have a temporary trail connection as shown here um, over the corridor. And the coolest part of all of this is folks get to walk across the corridor and to one side they see finished or, you know, a, 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 an advanced stage of completion tunnel. And on the right, they see tunnel construction uh, uh, in, in kind of earlier phases, which is really cool. Up here at the Cedar Lake Channel Pedestrian Bridge, uh, we've got a lot of work going on on the third of three um, major bridge structures in this area. So a lot of progress to point to in this area, um, especially as uh, channel users, even though the channel's closed right now, they can they can see that uh, see that progress as they're kind of floating in that area. Um, over here, we've got uh, this corridor protection barrier, which is uh, in an advanced stage of completion, as well as 
uh, the Loose Line Trail Bridge. So a lot of talk, continued discussion in the community about trails and a lot of progress on that front. We get to point to to the community of of work of of trail connections being being uh, constructed as part of the project. And then down at the Glenwood Avenue uh, construction site, we've got uh, progress being made, uh, significant progress being made on the roadway bridge as well as the LRT bridge in that area. Um, you know, a lot of work being done in advance of of kind of, you know, people are always talking about when some of these major structures, uh, especially roadway structures will open back up and they're excited to see that that progress being made because uh, they'll get to use that sooner or later. Uh, as always, we try to feature photos of people doing the work. That's part, one of the most important parts of this. And certainly for this committee, it's a big, big focus. And so we always are trying to uh, get people out during the workday to see the work being done. Um, so this is over at the Royalston Avenue Farmers Market Station, um, which is uh, we see certainly a good amount of activity these days. And and as it's the first, if you will, or closest station to downtown Minneapolis, a lot of eyes are on it as they're going over to the farmers market on these nice summer weekends. So um, it's people I've I've talked to community members who have gone there throughout the summer and they've been able to point to progress being made as the summer goes on. Um, of course, as we were, as I was just mentioning, we've got uh, segments being turned over to the systems contractor for right now. We're always highlighting the work that's being done behind the scenes of our systems contractor, uh, behind the scenes and, you know, of, of equipment being fabricated and delivered, as well as some of the initial work that's being done out in the corridor. We're really excited to uh, show off some of the work of, of APJV as they get uh, established more of a presence within the corridor in the coming in the coming weeks and months um, to be able to get the community used to that phase of work as well. That's my brief project update. Ashanti, I'll turn it back to you or, or Scott to, for any for any questions you might have. Thanks, David. <laughs> Thanks, David, for that update. Uh, are there any questions for David? All right, if not, uh... I'll turn it over to John Tao, who will provide the DBE progress and achievement report. Thank you. So uh, slide, I believe it's 19 or 18 here. So yeah, as of June 30th, these are the achievements for build to date by the contractor against um, uh, the contract and the DBE build to date as well. So the percentages are here. And then and if you look into the handouts, you will also see the um, payment application progress reports that will show you more detail about each specific uh, contract. Um, I do know that with the Ellis Black Franklin O&M project, it's coming to a close. We haven't had any new updates for that uh, recent pay apps. So I'm still waiting for that to come along. Um, so because of that, the pay app is only still showing pay app 23 from all last, the previous months that we shared. But um, overall, when you look at the numbers here, they're all exceeding their goals. And for us and our team, you know, what we're doing is we are um, just continuing to monitor this and then um, wait as the project office con continues negotiations with the systems contractor. Um, regarding their uh, you know, uh, impacts to escalation and all of those discussions with negotiation. So that is my update. If there are any questions, I can take them. Otherwise, I can hand it back off to the co-chairs. Any questions on the DB achievement on the progress thus far? All right, Krista. You are up. All right, good afternoon, everyone. If you could please go to the next slide. Things are going great. As you saw with John's um, deal for DB participation, we are at 20, per, little over 20% of the contract value, which is awesome to see. Um, DBEs are, many of them are hard at work right now. Um, so it's fun when we go out and do the site visits to see them out. And about um, great thing to show you guys is we have added an education piece to our monthly meetings with our 
subcontractor workforce meetings, which with a focus on the DBE education that we had proposed at the beginning of the project. Um, this last month, our meeting, uh, the education piece, uh, was safety and security with our workforce. It was a great um, presentation and roundtable discussion that was led by one of our safety representatives, Zach, on the project. We are getting ready for September's themed training, which is quality on the project. And our quality director, Nestor, will be our presenter and representative for that one. And you can see October, we have finance. November closeout in December, we will be holding a mingle networking event for our DBEs and other subcontractors for the project. This is a really neat added piece. And so far the kickback that I've received from our subs has been very positive. Any questions about this? If not, we'll go to the next slide. And here is the update from Cody, our finance lead for the project. The owner change orders approved through July 15th, as you can see, or 216 plus million dollars. And with the job DBE participation being uh, just a little over 20%. So great participation again, like we discussed, and a lot of meetings and mentoring going on with those. The other thing that I will reiterate, I think I might have announced it at the last meeting, not sure. But the Lunda part of the Lunda CS McCrossin joint venture has now entered into a MnDOT mentorship protege agreement with one of our lead DBEs on the project. And that is with PWS, formerly known as Pittswater and Sewer, um, Lee Meyer, the owner, um, Dale Even, and others on our project are a key part of this mentorship. And it'll be fun to see the growth through the project while the Lunda PWS. Um, partnership moves forward. And I do believe that is it for me on DBE participation. If anybody has any questions, I'm open to it. Otherwise, that is all I have for you today. Thank you, Krista. Um, I just wanted to note, uh, Scott, that we've had a couple committee members join. Um, so Hennepin County, Gilbert um, has joined. Uh, Barb Lau, and um, I'm probably going to need to check with Jason on our security. I don't know how Johnny Burns got um, into this meeting, but he joined us as well. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Jason. Johnny knows I'm kidding, but Jason That's probably my brother, knows. man. Shanti's my brother, so it's good to see you, man. <laughs> Look at Lane on here, too. I'm sorry. Hey, Lane. Um, from city of Minneapolis. Sorry. So actually, I, I would like to take this opportunity to let Johnny um, introduce himself. I know he's familiar to a lot of us on this committee, um, definitely committed to this work. Um, so uh, Johnny, if, you, if you'd like to introduce yourself. I, uh, I'll start the video. I had to wipe my tears away seeing all of these uh, uh, people that I know on here. So it's, it's good to be back uh, in, in Minneapolis and uh, sitting here today getting more information about what's happening with the southwest line i know uh, when i left it was still kind of we're going to do it we're not going to do it and so i'm happy to see it's done the numbers are looking really good too we have a lot of participation different people here so you know for those of you who don't know me uh my name is johnny burns i've left uh, minnesota and been back a few times uh i'm back again uh and uh I've worked in compliance and certification in four different states over the last uh, almost as long as Ashanti has. So he's been around for 40 years. So I've probably been like 25 or something. So, <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's uh, I'm happy to be uh, a part of this. And here I see John O'Fallon and, and Gilbert and and Jenny and um, Jenny and I uh, and Barb worked on so many things together over the years and you know, the carpenter. So anyway, Rick, even, oh my goodness. So I'm just going to uh, listen and see all the people, Krista and, and uh, Elaine, uh, geez. So it's good to see all the partners here. And I'm sorry if I missed anybody, but I'm happy to be part of this and uh, listen in and uh, see what Minneapolis's role is in this whole process. Thank you. Dreams, New York, 
That was great. That was great. All right. I'm I'm sorry, uh, but um moving on, uh Aldridge Parsons joint venture right. system DB update. Good afternoon, everybody. Mike Tony from APJV. Um, you know, it's exciting to hear that that some of the, the stations will be released um, so we can start building the foundations and setting the houses. That'd be great. Um, so uh, one month look ahead, uh, you know, we got a little bit of work with Gunner uh, doing some um, communication boxes in the ceiling before they close up. They've been uh, servicing this, uh, the housing stations, you know, the houses that are stored at the Honeywell facility at the warehouse and receiving and, and storing, you know, you know, monitoring that material. And Public Solution is doing their thing with the, keeping the public informed of where we're at. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now, but it looks like it's gonna pick up. Um, so more information next month. Uh, so next slide. Um, uh, through our change orders to date, owner approved, it's about $12 million. Um, and then the change orders to participation, Gunner's gotten almost 3 million of that. Uh, Generation Cable, another 400,000. Carlo, another, you know, 275,000. Um, we recently uh, executed a change order with Elite Fiber for another 100,000. Um, and another uh, change order to Gunner uh, for the communication work that we we've negotiated. So that's another hundred, you know, nine hundred thousand dollar increase to uh, our Gunner. So our participation change order is about thirty five percent to DBEs. So far to date, uh, we're about nine seventeen point nine percent. Any questions? It's Barb. I would just say great job, Mike, on on uh, change ordering and increasing all those DBEs. I like to see that. Thank you. It's good to see. That's true. Thanks. Seconding what what Barb had to say. Any other comments or questions? Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, we will do workforce participation reporting next. And I think uh, Brianne Lucio from MBHR's team is going to take the lead for that. Hi, thank you, Scott. And thanks everyone for joining. It looks like for the civil workforce participation percentages uh, through June 2022, they accrued 72,610 hours uh, total to date for the civil. Workforce percentage is 2,164,745 hours. Uh, we can see here by the chart that we've had a little increase here for the month of June. Uh, we have our women participation up 10% um, for the month and 8.2% contracted date. Um, and then for POCI participation, 26.45% up to 23.53% to date. Uh, next slide, please. And then we, this is the breakdown um, for hours per group. As you can see that we had uh, some slight increases, increases over last month's participation here. Uh, POCI men are coming in at 24.81% and POCI women 3.63%. Uh, and then um, we did have a little bit of a decline in uh, our female participation, um, but overall, um, you know, things are things are holding pretty steady there uh, for our women participation. Next slide, please. And then uh, for our trucking participation, MBE did come in at twenty seven point nine one six hours. ZTS didn't have any additional hours. Over last month, and then Rock On um, had quite an increase in hours for their participation, coming in at 2,016 hours. Next slide, please. For the Franklin workforce participations, again, only 97 hours worked on this one. Um, so there wasn't very uh, much increase. Um, I know that they're ramping down 
I do believe that they're almost done with this portion of the project. Um, so it looks like here that we didn't have any uh, women participation last month, but we did have 35.5% uh, POCI, um, and that's about it. Next slide, please. Uh, Franklin OMM workforce participation, again, 97 hours. Here's the breakdown. Uh, 34 hours were attributed to POCI uh, that month. Next slide, please. And then for the systems uh, contract, we uh, had 294 hours accrued last month, or excuse me, for the month of June. Um, and then it looks like here that we didn't have any uh, women participation, but we did have 5.44% POCI participation. Next slide, please. And then the breakdown, um, 16 hours were attributed to POCI men. Um, next slide. And then I'm going to pass it over to Krista Seberg if nobody has any questions regarding the workforce participation. Any questions on workforce participation? I just want to thank Brianne for, this is Elaine, for pitching in and taking over while I was out on leave. Um, I really appreciate all the hard work you did. No so problem, thank you. Elaine. Happy to help. Seconding. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elaine, and thanks, Brianne. All right, passing it over to Krista. All right, great. Thank you, guys. And I'm going to third it. Um, Brianne, thank you so much, you know, to working together and everything. And Elaine, welcome back. Um, what a great team you know, to be working with and stuff. So it's nice. All right, give you guys an update on the busy, busy schedule we've had lately um, with our workforce outreach, um, both in the growth, the education, the advocacy, and the retention of our workforce for the project. Um, we have our certain things that we cover every single month for our good faith efforts. Um, big piece is, of course, you know, onboarding and assisting our subcontractors and our own staff with the LMJV, with our new apprentices, not just with the Building Strong Communities Program, but with all apprentices, you know, coming new to our project. Uh, it's been a great, great um, rough program that we've put together for this and look forward to presenting it more and more uh, throughout the project for you guys regarding the, the assisting, you know, of our, our apprentices. Uh, the other two is the training, the continual training for our EEO and respectful workplace practices that aren't just for the LMJV, but also our subcontractors. Uh, so far, so good. Um, so when we've done our site visits and stuff, the positive feedback from all of our various field workers and stuff has been extremely positive about it. Um, our continual meetings with our LMJV workforce leads. Uh, again, regarding the apprentices and upcoming needs, as well as our mentorship program that we have going on. Uh, exciting thing about the mentorship program, I do have an upcoming meeting with some representatives from our Carpenters Hall who have a current uh, mentorship pro training program for their uh, journey level and other individuals from their hall and how their training program can become a part of our mentorship program. It's an exciting potential and I look forward to that. The other piece is our continual EEO and respectful education, you know, for, for the field, but also our monthly staff meeting. Uh, the first staff meeting of each month is des my part of it is designated for the respectful workplace training. So it isn't just a one and done piece, it's a continuation. Um, the other thing we do quite uh, every other week is Larry uh, Wall, uh, one of our safety individuals, takes me on a tour, uh, job site visit. And this last couple weeks ago, we went and visited the Blake area. Um, I was able to visit with LMJV crew members, uh, including one of our Building Strong uh, representatives that we sponsored for the program. 
And we are also able to visit with representatives from both Egan and North Country Concrete. So if you could go to the next slide, if there's any questions, we'll cover it at the end of my good faith effort piece. So um, anyways, continuation of this, we did, we had representation, a group of six individuals from um, our team at the LMJV, as well as two of our subs attended the Construct Tomorrow fundraising event at Top Golf. It was a great event. The networking there was, oh, priceless. I will just put it that way. It was great. Uh, then we also did the look ahead at major industry um, meeting with our group to discuss where the light rail should be involved, uh, as well as our own um, participation. And there will be a discussion coming up about that for you guys. We are also in the planning stages for a, a big outreach event that's going to be pushed now until April of 2023. Um, regarding a trades awareness event. And we are going to be meeting um, between now and then, reoccurring with uh, union representatives, contractors, and CBOs regarding this great event that will be coming up. And this one's great. Hey, look, Rick, you're in the meeting. Um, I have now scheduled an in-person meeting with our exciting newly appointed BSC Executive Director, Rick Mardigan, for next week and um, can't wait. Seriously, very excited about it. You know, as you guys have heard, you know, our involvement with Building Strong Communities has been great. Uh, it's gonna, I, in my opinion, gonna be even better now. So welcome, Rick, I look forward to it. And then I am continuing the schedule review meetings with our CBOs. You're gonna see in an upcoming slide what's really exciting, you guys, and here's a shocker to the CBOs because my email didn't get out quick enough. But in September, late September, well, the 21st of September, and I will be sending out, like I said, an invite for this, the LMJV team, as well as Mike and the systems team, we are going to be holding a contractor and CBO ming lunch and mingle on September 21st at our office. And um, it's gonna give everybody just that opportunity to be together you know, kind of in a lighthearted, you know, environment and stuff, and just to be able to reconnect and find out how everybody can be working together to help each other, um, as well as we're going to have a resource section table with takeaway handouts from the different CBOs that our subcontractors can take with them and, you know, move forward with their scheduling and participation with them. So those are those pieces. If you will go to the next slide, please. Here's a couple of pictures because I have some other highlights to give you guys of upcoming events, but here's our Blake area visit, which was great. And you can see in the picture, hey, there I am, as well as Katie from CS McCrossin. She's always been my, my side partner on things. Um, we did get some news today that Katie's last week is next week with CS McCrossin. Um, so for me, it was, it was kind of hard. It was heartbreaking because as you guys know, you know, when you lose great, um, part of, you know, daily friends that you work with, um, it, it's tough because we do have a great team. So today is very exciting with having Rick and Johnny back, but it's also very, it's a tough day too, because I'm going to be losing, losing my, my partner, um, Katie. So you guys, we'll be doing something for her coming up, so watch for that. Next slide, please. Here's uh, just the note about the Construct Tomorrow fundraiser that we were at. As you can see, here's our team that was represented. There's myself. Larry, of course, is in the Safety Orange. That's our safety director. Uh, we have um, Megan. Or, there we go. We have uh, Aaron from Egan. We have Ashley from our field, but we also have Norma from the Urban League. Um, both Ashley and Norma had never golfed before, you guys. So it was really, number one, it was a great event for people to be able to talk with others. Dan McConnell was next to us, which was awesome. Um, it was great. But there's our team. I won't tell you how super we did. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that for the golfing piece. You go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, here's the one that's exciting for me. Um, I told you we're going to be involved in quite a few industry-wide um, week celebrations as well events. This week going on right now is the National Conference for the Association of Women in Construction, so NAWIC. It's taking place right here in Minneapolis. Lots of great training events going on, network events. There's project tours. We didn't get um, invited to do the project tour. Uh, it was national people setting it up, but we've been involved quite a bit with it. Um, Minger Construction is there right now with representation as well as others. Uh, October is Construction Inclusion Week. Great week. There's a link online. If you Google Construction Inclusion Week for Minnesota, you can get on there and get registered. Many different training events, training tools for DEI. It is awesome. This is going to be their second, so their first annual um, event. But anyways, that one. November is National Apprenticeship Week. We will be having a celebration all week long of not just the great apprentices that we have. Some may be laid off by them, but still the celebration of our apprenticeships, apprentices on our project, but also the great mentoring teams that we have that are helping our apprentices. That's another big celebration we'll be doing. January, let's jump ahead to January is the Minnesota Construction Summit that is put on by the AGC, AWC, and others. Great again, there's going to be training things taking place for it. It's at the River Center. And then March is another awesome one, is the Women in Construction Week. Uh, the Light Rail Project has many things that we will be participating in as well as sponsoring for that week, such as our Rosies of the Rail group. Um, and that one is actually going to be kicked off in October, the Rosies of the Rail Roundtable. Um, we have four different dates set already as well as topics where we will be having roundtable discussions. We will be sharing their, their tricks of the trades and different things or success tools and such. We have the work and home balance, um, mental health issues, um, being a part of the team, you know, women in the construction industry, and also advancing and strengthening your career are the topics that we're looking at. So kind of exciting. September again, you guys, here's our light rail focus things. September, we have the CBO and contractor networking event. February, there will be a light rail focused event. Not sure exactly what that looks like yet, but I have a feeling it's going to have something to do with building strong communities. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> but anyways, and then the last one um, for right now that is in the works is our um, event that we're planning that is going to be a trades awareness event with the systems contract as well as Dunwoody. Dunwoody will be where the event is going to be held and uh, exciting to talk about it and to be able to show you guys about it real soon. That is it right there for upcoming industry events. So if you want to go to the next slide, here's July's activities for coming in and coming out, going out of the project, check out these numbers. There's not a lot of them, but if you look at the entering into the project, you have transfers, no rehires, and then a few hires. So there are 11 total, with eight of them being POCI males. Um, I couldn't believe when I got those numbers, you guys. Fantastic job our team is doing regarding that um, and big kudos were given to our team and then if you look at our exiting the project there are there were four layoffs um, due to the down of our work because of our structures pretty much wrapping up and then also the voluntary leave we had two individuals that left so that is it for me for now and i am open for questions and comments Thanks, Krista. Any questions for Krista? Well, I have one question if, if others aren't going to jump in. In terms of the new hires, rehires, transfers, like out of 
what's the sort of comparison? How many workers are we talking total in comparison to the number of workers we're, we're talking about here? I'm just trying to get a sense of scale. You don't have to have an exact sure. number. Nope, and I can look that up. So by the way, this slide right here is just for the Lunda CS McCrossan, the Lunda and the CS McCrossan. So the three entities, it doesn't include yep. everybody on the project. So the sure. workforce hours, let's see, I just got them. Cody, our, our numbers guy, our finance guy and our numbers guy was out. And so I just received his numbers. Oh, just a little bit ago. So let me pull up his his piece. And it's a great question, Scott, and I should know them. I did last month, um, but I know things have changed. So let me go to the second slide and take a look at uh, equipment operators. This is total equipment operators, though, so I will be off a little. You're looking, let's see, 150. You're probably looking at a couple hundred, Scott. Okay, great. All right. Yeah, almost, almost close to 300. Good perspective, so thank you. You bet, Scott, thank you. Other questions for Krista? All right. Thanks, Here's guys. Another. Hearing none, we'll turn it over to uh, Mike to jump into APJV's workforce activities. All right. Um, yeah, next slide. All right. So um, with the three TPS stations that are going to be turned over, what that consists of is building foundations and pouring concrete so we can set the, the houses that you saw on the screens earlier that were built by Siemens. Um, so they'll be, they'll be building the foundations on three of the the traction power substations coming this year and we'll begin really the bulk next next spring um but that is exciting um we had limited hours in june i mean less than 300 hours in june and and less than 200 hours in um in 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 july you know and that's mostly servicing the warehouse equipment and just doing piecemeal st stuff uh, and it can't be more than 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 five into individuals at most, you just, you know, a day here, a day there with one individual getting a lot of the hours. So that's where we stand about it. Um, we're going to participate next week in mock interviews. So I'll be up there on next Friday. Um, we're going to have our, our training with Summit Academy on October 13th uh, for their cohort. Uh, we did this last year. It was really great. Uh, so I know Summit's looking forward to it. Uh, Chris Henning. Um, and the training will, you know, include hands-on activity with our, our traveling utility trailer uh, and a training, a safety course. And I will be invited by this, we'll invite the subcontractors and unions to join us and a couple people in this meeting. So that'll be good. I look forward to seeing you guys next month in September and, and meeting the CBOs at the network and meet and greet on the 21st. Um, so that's where we stand now. Awesome. Thank you for those updates. Any questions on APJV's pieces? Anyone? Well, hearing none, um, appreciate those updates and good to hear about the uh, mock interviews and the and the training day. That's that's great. I'm glad that those are moving forward. So I will, uh, I'll turn it over to Ashanti. Thank you, Scott. Um, we have, uh, I wanna welcome, uh, we have three guests today, uh, Noah Pratt, Derek Gibbons, and Eric Engstrom from the Union Halls. And uh, want to also thank them for taking the time to join us today. Um, and at this time, I want to invite each of you to provide a short introduction for the members that are not familiar with you or, or with your work. Um, and we can begin with Noah, followed by Derek, and then Eric. Noah?
Perhaps Noah is having some difficulties. Um, so how about there? Hey, uh, can can you guys hear me well enough? Sorry, I was having trouble getting unmuted there. We can hear you, Noah, but you're cutting uh, in and out a little bit. All right, I think Noah might be having some difficulties. Derek, you want to go ahead and inter introduce yourself? Certainly. Uh, my name is uh, Derek Givens. I am a business agent with uh, IBW Local 292 and uh, happy to be a part of this. Thank you. And Eric. Eric, are you on? All right. Um, and then we can go back to Noah to see if he's resolved his issues. Noah, can you hear us? All right, so this is not off to a good start. Um, uh, so Derek, thank you for that introduction. Um, I know that last month our discussion dropped off as we were beginning to talk about, you know, accountability and, uh, uh, you know, accountability from the public agencies, our contractors, our partners, and our stakeholders for this for this project. Um, I know some of the questions uh, that came up as part of that is that, um, you know, what is, what what, you know, just some understanding around the contacts from the contractors uh, on this project in terms of reaching out to the union halls um, in, in terms of workers um, and uh, for this project and trying to get a feel for, for that. And then also, you know, how do we incorporate uh, the various uh, expertise services and um, activities that uh, some of our community-based organizations and nonprofits bring and how do we make that connection and that synergy for contractors unions uh, and nonprofits to help forward our, our objectives and goals for this project um, and i'll invite scott to add anything um, from a workforce perspective yeah, I appreciate that, Shanti. And I, I think that that, you know, in a lot of ways covers it. I think one of the things I know I've I've been thinking about as I've become more and more involved in this work is how do we make sure that, you know, we're, we as human rights, you know, our relationship in some ways is primarily with our certificate holders, with the contractors. But also, I think there's this recognition that, you know, the, the work is not just done on a single project basis. It's not just done on a single contractor basis. And a lot of the workforce challenges that are faced in terms of entry are things where there are pieces of the puzzle that community-based organizations, contractors, unions, other folks are all working together on. And I think for us, really making sure that we're trying to play a role to bring folks together thinking about these issues and thinking about where are these challenges? Because clearly there are barriers to entry into the field. And we also know that there are some significant workforce challenges. And so trying to you know, play, play an active role there. And I think on a project as big as, you know, as this one, also recognizing that you know, this is something that goes over the course of years and there are folks potentially coming in as apprentices and getting into the, getting to the end of this project as journey level workers and so trying to make sure that within all of that there's you know some productive conversation about how do we do retention how do we keep people in the field since trying to up these numbers is always going to be more challenging you know as when there are retention issues as well so just glad folks are willing to come to the table and have the conversation and i think you know for the noah derek and eric one of the things we've had i think over the last few months is a really robust discussion about the, you know, how does this group operate in a way that's most effective? And I think been really honest and candid about that. So excited to be able to have some more folks to the table. So 
Okay, I'm gonna try one more time. I, I, we got a note from Noah. He's gonna try to connect with a different device. Noah, are you there? I'm here. Uh, All right. How are we? How are we sounding now? Great. It's maybe an echo. Great. It's maybe an echo. Yeah, you might need to it's that other echo. device. Either mute that other device or disconnect the other one. Yeah. Yeah. This is it's embarrassing. I'm usually not so bad at this stuff. I'm usually not so bad at this stuff. That's all right. You're you're amongst good people. Okay. I think we should be better now. All right. Um, if uh, if you guys will excuse my uh, technical difficulties here, uh, my name is Noah Pratt, and I am a business representative with uh, the Carpenters North Central States Regional Council, and I am a pile driver by trade. I worked in the field uh, under the highway heavy agreement for my whole career, and uh, that was about 15 years in the field. And now I've been with the council for the last going on four now. And yeah, I'm just happy to be part of this committee. And yeah, absolutely uh, a pleasure to be here. And I'm happy to do whatever I can to help the group. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to open it up to committee members. I, I certainly can, can start this discussion and, and probably could add some questions, but um, this is really uh, to get information and, and get some questions that uh, come from this committee um, and not necessarily from myself or Metropolitan Council, but um, I certainly have some questions, but uh, I'm, I'd like to open it up. Um, so please uh, unmute yourself. Um, Ask your question. Hi, this is Maura Brown. Uh, welcome, Noah. Um, I'm wondering what you can tell us about the status of your bench right now and how many requests you're getting and able to fill for um, moving people into work. All right. Yeah, those, those are good questions. So um, as of right now, the status of the carpenters bench. So I do represent both carpenters and pile drivers, uh, both crafts. Uh, the status of the carpenters bench is essentially pretty pretty empty um, as, as far as uh, what we've got for the pile drivers. We we ever since basically February we've been all hands on deck, and only recently we've seen some people come back. So you're looking at. As far as the pile drivers go, you're looking those numbers. I'm I'm a little more familiar with those. Uh, you're looking at just under 300 members, and we haven't seen more than say five or six uh, individuals on the list at one given time since last February. Um, and then as far as the the requests have go gone, um, as as we heard earlier on the on the status of the project, a lot of the structures have been slowing down, so we haven't gotten a whole lot of requests. Um, in the last twelve months, we've gotten one one request for manpower. Now that's besides if you consider um, putting on new apprentices and things like that. Um, I believe there might have been a couple since over the last year, but the joint venture has done a really good job of kind of. Um, handling those things internally. Um, so long story short, we haven't we haven't received any requests for for manpower on the project in the last six months. Derek, you want to I'm sorry, Moore, did you have a backup question or, or I was going to ask <laughs> Derek that same question? That'd be great to ask Derek that question. But my follow up is um, what are the barriers you're encountering in recruiting additional people into the uh, unions that you're working with? And um, I've heard from some contractors that um, they can't take more apprentices because they're not enough journey level workers. Has that been your experience for the carpenters and the pile drivers? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think the, the apprentice to journeyman ratios definitely can be taken into, into account there. Um, but overall, it's just um, 
as far as any hurdles internally with our with our trade, it's just been getting getting commitment from the contractors. And I think a lot of that just comes from, you know, having a, a really full and solid workforce that they that they're working with um, and just being a little hesitant maybe to bring on new people as the project's starting to slow down structures wise. Um, earlier on, there were there were a lot more things moving around there, but uh, really, a, as far as barriers go, it's just a, how how many individuals can the can the industry sustain? Because you know, I it, it common sense tells us that you know we don't want to bring um, new people on if we can't sustain them and keep them busy and and make them profitable. Um, so, you know, we got to be really cognizant of of bringing on new people. And um, I think we've 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 done a good job of manning the work and maintaining, um, you know, our, our workforce. Um, but, yeah, I, I hopefully I, I answered your question. I didn't dance around that, did I? Um, I hear what you're saying about not wanting to bring people in that there wouldn't be steady work for. But I guess what I'm hearing um, in multiple spaces is that there aren't enough workers. Um, and that that's going to get worse as more and more journey level workers retire. And so it seems to me that there would be some urgency around recruitment right now that may vary trade to trade. So, you know, asking you as the expert in your trade, um, if there, if there's any urgency about bringing more people in at this point. You know, that and yeah, absolutely. There is there is, uh, you know, in general, there is uh, an overall shortage of manpower. Um, I'm just, I'm looking in terms of the season, uh, and the sense of urgency is definitely there, but when it comes to looking into September, October, November, these are the months where the projects are slowing down. Um, and we are, we're, we're all throughout the year. We're in schools. We're, we're making efforts for recruiting, uh, Dunwoody, uh, Dakota tech, you know, a lot of the trade schools as well. Um, and you know, it's more once, once the school year starts to kick in, that's, that's when we kind of get real heavy into recruiting, um, at the high school level and at the trade school level. Um, but it, it, any other efforts that we have going on there, there, it's a year round process and we're, there's, there's really no, no lag on, on the recruiting effort. It's just a matter of placing people when we can. Thank you. Back to you, Ashanti. I would just open up that those same questions to Derek and get his perspective from his uh, his trade. So certainly, I um, without having anyone repeat the questions, I'll try to do my best to recall from memory here um, in terms of my response. So, um, our books right now we have uh, journey workers, uh, a few hundred that are still out of work, but I think what we're seeing we're impacted by. Um, things that uh, came to existence as a result of COVID, like uh, supply chain, um, not being able to get the materials and things that are necessary to, to perform the work and do the, do the jobs. Um, we've, I've seen uh, 12, 12 apprentices, uh, minority apprentices be dispatched to uh, this light rail project uh, this year. Um, in terms of workforce, um, again, with us having several hundred of you know, 300 people on the books yet um, going out for work. Um, we have the resources. We just, uh, we don't have the um, viable opportunities at this point in time. So um, in our efforts to bring in more people, uh, we they, they're never at rest. Uh, we, we're always interviewing and cycling people through. Um, I don't know, did I miss something? <laughs> I think you covered it. Um, I see that we have Eric on at this time. Eric, you want to provide a brief introduction uh, to this committee? Um, and then uh, the question is um, relative to uh, calls to for manpower on this project. And then also uh, in terms of what does your bench look like at this point um, in, in the year? And uh, how do you? How does your uh, trade go about uh, recruiting 
new members into the trade. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Eric Engstrom. I'm a business agent, Southwest Metro business agent for Labor's Local 5, 6, and just not drop off our off our books, if you will, um, that or we can't get a hold of them. So um, we've always had, we always have people uh, requesting information on how to get in contact with contractors and getting it, uh, getting placed for employment rather. And we've been fairly successful in doing so. We've sent quite a few to the LRT. Um, we've been successful in doing that as well. Multiple uh, contractors as well, you know, as far as our subcontractors go, um, been helping them out too. Uh, as far as retainage goes, I'm not sure, you know, how many end up dropping off that they just figure out, you know, once they, once this is new to them, that they figure out that this isn't quite the trade for them. Um, as a career labor, it's, it's not easy. You know, we're, we're basically going to work every day. We're getting paid to go to the gym. That's the way I look at it. I've always looked at it that way and getting paid pretty dang good at that. So um, now as far as if you're, if you're looking for numbers, as far as how many we've sent over, I don't have those in front of me as of right now. I have reached out to my dispatcher, Sterling Sanders. I know that we do have those numbers that we've sent over to the LRT. Uh, I can obtain those. I just don't have them at this, at this minute right now. Um, as far as recruitment, we are doing, I'd say approximately about 35 to 45 career fairs a year. Um, then again, we're, you know, we're, we're pretty successful in doing that as well, as far as bringing new members on with us. And, um, uh, I just had a, a young gal, I got to actually follow up with her right now as she's looking for work. So I mean, we're always, we're always welcoming, um, new new people coming in, you know, and, and attempting to place them too. And as far as helping them, uh, finding an employer to, to, to place them with in order to get them sponsored, that's not an issue. Um, I just don't, like I said, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now, but I can't obtain those. That's not a problem. Thanks. One of the, one of the things that, um, I would like to hear from uh, each of you is um, what sorts of activities, initiatives are you engaged with um, that involve any uh, partnerships with contractors, uh, community-based organizations, um, and others to be intentional about uh, recruiting and bringing information to communities who historically have not had access or have don't have the information in terms of how to get into the trades or 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 know which path to follow if that's a a career path for them or not. Can you talk a little about any of those initiatives that uh, your trades are involved with? And I'm seeing uh, uh, Dan uh, raise his hand as well. Yeah, I mean, if I could just jump in, um, you know, building strong communities, and not to put Rick on the on the on the hot seat here, but that's really you know our uh, our main effort. We also you know construct tomorrow events, uh, and Rick also you know understands the history. Of the Department of Labor requires us to disseminate information to community-based organizations and myriad of people to do this outreach work. Um, and uh, all the trades participate in those programs. We work on this very hard. We take it very seriously. We want to um, have the workforce reflect the broader community. Um, it, and the evidence of that commitment is the investment we're making in building strong communities uh, that is funded by the trades. And now we're going after grant money to supplement that. But uh, we made a multi-year commitment to put a full-time person on and I think the best person we could possibly find in the state of Minnesota to help us with this work. Thanks, Dan. I, I appreciate that and um, definitely appreciate the efforts of building strong communities. Um, I guess, but my question uh, specifically was about any partnerships, uh, information and um, uh, getting information. Are there any partnerships that any of the trades are 
involved with that include community-based organizations, nonprofits, contractors specifically, um, and are intentional about recruiting and getting folks from communities that have historically not had access to the trades or have not, or don't know how to access the trades or pursue this as a career. Are there any intentional efforts, initiatives, um, and specifically partnerships that you can talk about? There are those things. I have 25 affiliates that have 25 different sets of those partnerships, and I'm not prepared to um, list all of those things at this time, but we've been working on this, I think, since probably in early 1970s with mixed success, right? We have had partnerships with the Urban League. We've partnered with Summit Academy. We've partnered with just about everybody you can think of to try and tackle this problem. Again, the commitment that we made to funding building strong communities is to try and get our arms around all these things. I think one of the downfalls of our past efforts has been we put a get together a partnership or an effort and signed a deal and then walk away from it and expect it to just take off and do on its own. And what we've done under my leadership is trying to put uh, an ongoing effort, uh, working on it every day, again, building strong communities is my answer to that, to that question. That is what we are investing our resources in to try and uh, take this on in a holistic manner. Thanks. Um, I, I would like to hear from the trades on that question. So I can I can speak. Uh, this is Derek Gibbons here. Um, with respect to uh, some of the things we may be doing over at the at the IBW, um, we have the uh, Electrical Workers Minority Caucus, which I'm I'm a I'm active in actively involved with, and we do a lot of uh, community outreach. Um, one of the things that we do that we uh, that has been a real success for we call it EWMC in the parks, and over the course of the summer we will. Uh, go out to uh, North Commons Park in North Minneapolis and essentially set up uh, a, a grill and and tables. Uh, and we serve, uh, you know, our, mo our, 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 <clears throat> excuse me, our motto is that we, we, we're serving the community food and opportunity. So we, we go out there and we stand out there for four to six hours on these Saturdays and we engage with the community. Uh, we talk with them about not only our trade, but the building trades in general. Um, last year, I was able to partner with one of our signatory contractors and have him come out to one of those events. And we hired two people right off the street, which um, is, is, is just simply amazing and impactful because, you know, we want to try to affect generational poverty in a, in a positive sense. So that's something that we're doing at, with the electrical workers. And it's, uh, it's, it's been a success, in my opinion. Thanks, Derek. And if uh, folks on this committee wanted to support that effort or or be a part of it, um, how how could they be a part of it? North, North Commons is definitely a, a spot I'm familiar with. Definitely a place I've made my my mark on the on the on the hard hard tops there. Um, but uh, if, if 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 folks wanted to support this effort, how how could they do that? Uh, get in touch with me. Uh, we're 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 going to be out there this uh, Saturday, the twenty seventh of August, um, doing it again, and we'll do it once more in September. So we have a couple of dates uh, yet on the calendar, um, and I'd be happy to share that information with anyone. Um, they would just reach out to me. I, I don't. I'm not too familiar with uh, uh, WebEx meetings, so I don't know how to put information in the chat. But I'd I'd be happy to share my contact info. All right. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, Eric or Noah? Yeah, this is Noah Pratt. Uh, so without without going and digging up a like a comprehensive list of, of everything that we are involved in, uh, I guess I'm not quite prepared for that. But I, I do have a few things that we've worked on here recently. Um, one is a partnership that we have with MnDOT. It's a, it's a Minnesota uh, highway heavy industry orientation program that we've got set up. 
Um, and this is in, uh, in the past, we've worked with, with groups like Deed um, for recruiting. And uh, this specifically targets folks, you know, uh, females, people of color, um, people who are in the, you know, maybe coming out of the legal system and looking for a new start there. Um, it, and basically it's a, it's a six week program. Um, and what that is, is it's, it's a, basically it's a step into the, the world of construction in the highway heavy world. And so that kind of fits into this call pretty well because of the, the nature of the, you know, the, the project being on the highway heavy side of things. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the success we've had in the past with that program. Um, we've had um, this last year, we had seven participants. And out of those seven, we have seven participants uh, still working and that, that uh, they graduated in, in April. And so everybody's happy, uh, happily employed and, and uh, now members of uh, the Carpenters, the UBC. Um, and of, the, of that group, um, you know, it's a, like I said, it's a mixed group of, of females and people of color. A um, couple individuals who are, um, you know, on parole looking to ma make a good change in their life. And I just see that program as being such a, this, this, uh, this last wave of individuals we had was just a, it was a breath of fresh air. Um, just seeing the, you know, just, just the commitment that people put in there. They're willing to take six weeks of their life and uh, just basically with no no monetary gain or anything like that. And just with the looking at the prospect of maybe having, you know, just turning your life around, get having another crack at having a good career. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess that's one of the things that we do. Um, then more recently, also uh, with Dan McConnell and Minneapolis Building Trades, um, we did a Central Minnesota Building Trades Boot Camp, and that was that was specifically um, for the area, um, the La uh, Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe up, up up there in Hinkley and Mille Lacs and Aiken up there, um, and that was a really good group. We had a, a good good out, uh, turnout there. Some young folks, uh, high school age, young adults, kind of a mixed bag, um, and just yeah, just. If nothing else, we're we're showing the people um, what what uh, you know what what it's like to get your hands dirty. Maybe do a little bit of the exercises and just opening doors. Really, we're not we're we're looking for a we're looking for a, just just giving people an opportunity. And that's really what I've got without without um, going and preparing a, a thorough report for you. So I hope that does well enough for you. No, that's that's definitely good information. Um, one of the things that came, one of the things that you said that really kind of struck a chord with me is, you know, that individuals are committing to six weeks out of their lives unpaid. Um, and also, uh, most people on, on this committee know that I also, uh, I worked at MnDOT for 27 years before, prior to coming to the council. Um, and I know one of the things that they were looking at is, um, the opportunity or ability to provide stipends um, and, and, and for, for some of those programs. And I just wanted to get your, your take on if you think that that would be um, an important step in, in helping uh, initiatives like that, because I think it is a good and positive uh, step and a good initiative. But um, yeah, that, that's a big commitment um, for, for folks to take without uh, any type of uh, compensation. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, that having the idea of the stipend would, would be a, definitely a good idea. You're talking, these, these folks have to travel, they have to bring themselves to, to the location and they have to, you know, you know, essentially they're, they're signing off on not being able to work for six weeks. So I think the idea of having a stipend would be good. Um, you know, obviously it's, it shouldn't be, construed as that's the that's what you're really after is the stipend but you know what i don't think there's really any way to control that so you know what i think that i think overall you're you're helping the people that want to be helped and i think that's a great idea eric anything that you would like to add to that to this part of the conversation uh no i mean I, again uh, we also, I think it was mentioned earlier, Summit Academy. Uh, I know uh, that we participate in doing mock interviews with them. 
I've worked with uh, a few people, um, uh, graduates from that program and, and assisting them and in getting into our program. Um, and so we just continue to do things like that to uh, reach out to the community and um, try to further diversify, uh, you know, the IBEW. Yep, and I, I apologize. Um, I, I do like hearing from you, Derek, but it probably sounded like Derek and I was saying, Eric, um, it certainly no, did, and I apologize. I was like, why is he asking me again? But anyway, I was ready to give you something. And Ashante, Eric uh, tells me his connection is really poor right now, so. All right, okay. Um, again, and I don't, I don't want to dominate this conversation, so again, if there's any questions or anything that um, other committee members have or want uh, information uh, 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 and uh, this opportunity that we have to connect with uh, IB, IBW, uh, the laborers, and the carpenters. Ashanti, this is Noah Noah Pratt again. Um, I did have something I, I totally spaced out. Um, we do have our APEX program. I don't know if anybody on the call is familiar with the APEX program, but um, it's it's another um, similar similar to our MnDOT program that we that we do. That's more on the carpenter side of things. Sometimes, and I apologize. I know it's all, we're all one big happy family on the carpenters here, but sometimes I get I get stuck in my own little highway heavy world, little pile driver corner, and <laughs> so I apologize. Not a problem. And and honestly, um, it's it's one of the, the the program that you participated in with um, MnDOT and that partnership is really one of the reasons why you know I asked the question. Um, I know that MnDOT has some uh, compliance uh, initiatives um, specifically uh, relative to workforce. And one of, one of those aspects um, is a requirement on the federal side for uh, trade unions, or let me, let me say, let me rephrase that. Contractors who are signatory to uh, labor agreements um, have a responsibility to develop programs and initiatives with those uh, trade associations um, to bring in more women and people of color into the industry. And so it's it's initiatives like that. And I know that MnDOT partners with community-based organizations, unions, um, and others to put these programs together. So I think it's just important for people to understand kind of those relationships, how they're formed, um, impacts, and is there opportunity, um, you know, those those workers can just as well work on this project or any other project um, throughout. So I just think it's, it's good information for people to have and um, understand how they can connect uh, their community, uh, their constituents with some of these uh, programs and initiatives. So no, appreciate uh, you bringing the information uh, to this committee. Noah? This is Elaine Valadez. Can you talk more about the Apex project uh, program with the carpenters? I sure can, Elaine. Um, so the Apex program is very similar to how I described uh, our our MnDOT program in that um, it's your your targeting uh, community groups, your um, females, people of color. Um, it's a five week program. This one is. And they're getting more of the the general um, carpentry, um, general trades uh, exposure, I believe. I and Lane, I, I apologize to the group here. I I am not specifically involved in the Apex program, but I can I can I know enough to be dangerous. We'll say. Um, so they're they're doing projects like uh, you know putting together some some walls, whether it be wood or steel. Um, maybe some, some doing some drywall. It's more focused on the commercial, on the commercial side of things. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's essentially the same idea as how I described the MnDOT program in that by the, by the end of that five weeks, we're looking to get them uh, plugged in with a contractor. Um, if, if they decide at the end of that, you know, that, Hey, you know, it's, it's great that we did all this stuff, but it's not for me, you know, maybe it gives people an idea that, we can check that off the off the list. That's not something that we want to do with our lives. Um, I think it gives a good opportunity to kind of give those people um, that are participating just just a, an idea to, you know, 
give you a, a small taste and whether it's something you like or something you don't. And like Eric had alluded to, you know, we get the same deal where people start up and Hey, thanks, but it doesn't work out. Well, at this point in time, you don't, you haven't committed to an apprenticeship or anything like that with these programs. It gives you a little more of a, a bite-sized taste and kind of get your, get your lips wet, so to speak. Thank thanks, you. Sarah. And as I understand it, because um, I went out and did a, one of my colleagues and I went out and did a presentation with the Carpenters. Um, on this APAX program, they have separate classes for women and people of color and try to address the specific challenges that the two groups have or may have in the construction industry. And my understanding is that that is designed to ensure that they succeed and and that they are more motivated to get into the trades. Absolutely. And I see, uh, Rick, I saw you put in the chat that you can assist in the explanation. And John, I see you've got your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, for all the union uh, reps here today, I just want to thank you so much. I think this is your third time and second in 18 months that you've uh, come here and talked about really the wonderful work that you do. It's incredible. I've had the honor and pleasure to be a part of some of this, uh, and I really believe in your programs, your recruiting efforts. You got the highest quality training. You're diversifying all over the uh, Minnesota, which is just incredible. I think you are very well connected to many organizations. Um, and uh, I think you do a good job of bringing people into the industry. Um, so I just, you know, many kudos out to you. Um, so I, I, I always find it interesting in these uh, topics because um, one of the pieces that we, I don't believe that you can uh, have con much control over. So it'd be kind of interesting to hear your viewpoint on that is, Really, uh, people have heard my voice many from you know long enough on this uh, committee is like, okay, you're doing an incredible job bringing them in, but who's keeping them? How long are we keeping them? And are they graduating? And and even Rick, you and I have had conversations about Melon Dolly. We don't even know if all the work on this committee and all these works on this effort from the the great work that is being done. Like, who's graduating? What are the people of color? Are they graduating? Are they? Uh, or are they um, not the ones who are getting full careers? Um, I just worked with somebody today. I think he has four W-2s already this year. And um, this has gone on for eight years for the guy. And uh, he's ready to just get out because he can't get that regular job that so many of the, the white males get and are solid on and that we still continue to see the stats on. And it's really hard to, uh, it, thankfully, he, uh, he journeyed out. But um, we're trying to career move him. Right. You get them out of the industry because, it, he, you know, four kids, it's tough, man. It's a tough job. So um, this kind of, uh, you know, conversation would be great to have with the top seven contractors on this project, really, and just find out what are they strategies for keeping the people of color and females and everything on there? Because you guys are doing great. Um, I'd love to hear also, like, if you have any insights on how. Uh, you know, I, it'd be great to know the reports. Uh, Mara, I thought your question was incredible. Uh, that's what I'd love to hear every month at this meeting. Uh, October is my last meeting. Uh, I'll be leaving the board, but uh, I'd love to hear, you know, like every meeting, uh, you know, Dan, I don't know if it comes through you, but hey, you know, we had, uh, you know, uh, electricians got two phone calls and uh, this other trade got one phone call. And other than that, no one called. And, you know, and why? Well, maybe the halls are empty. You know, what kind of communications went on? Um, so I'm more into that. I think you, you know, the Apex and the WISAs and all the other great stuff, Construct Tomorrow's, BSCs, you know, uh, nonprofit fund in September is all great. But when it comes down to it, people need careers over jobs, and we got to figure out how that's going to work. And I, I don't think, personally, just on my view, that you have control over keeping people in the field to graduate and achieve what we all want them to achieve is an apprentice level to journey level status and have a college degree in their back pocket. And so I'd love that conversation to happen. And I'm not sure if that happens here or where, but just throwing out comments, questions, ideas. Yeah, 
any comments or response to what John brought up? Um, I think there are some good points. And I guess one thing too, uh, that, that I think one of the specific things that John kind of hinted at is, you know, attrition. Um, do we have a sense of what the attrition rate is uh, just overall, regardless of gender, uh, race, ethnicity? And then is there a difference um, when it comes to women and people of color in terms of attrition, apprenticeship to journey level status? Um, I, I mean, years ago, I heard some numbers um, in terms of that rate, but I, I guess I'd want to hear uh, from the experts, what what what's your sense of, uh, do you know that rate or what's your sense? I don't know that rate. Um, it's for, you know, I know that apprenticeship programs do their best to, to turn people out and and get them through the program. That's their goal. They're investing money in these people, investing time in these people, and they want to have successful people, uh, successful workers come out of it. Um, I can talk about my own experience. I can tell you, you know, I think one of the things were that I would suggest doing differently, uh, just think about my own experience. When I turned out, um, I get, took a job working for a large electrical contractor on a large project. When that project was done, despite all of my efforts to, you know, stand out and uh, do a great job and try and get on the core crew or, you know, get onto that contractor a long time. Uh, all my efforts got me the uh, the option of, do you want to be the first one laid off or the last one laid off from the project? So I think when we are tying workforce diversification efforts to project specific uh, goals, I think that's actually probably hurting us because those individuals get identified with that project. And then when that project's done, that contractor maybe doesn't need them anymore. So I think, you know, contractors do every decision on who to hire someone, who they hire, who they fire. The unions represent the people that the contractors make that decision about. And, you know, if we want to have a longer conversation about uh, some things that I think we're doing well and something that I don't think we're doing well, I'm happy to, to do that. I don't know that we're going to have time today, but. That's my reaction to what Rick said. Dan, this is Maura. Um, do you think you'd be able to provide that information that John was requesting at future meetings? If you send me any, if someone sends me an email with a request for some information, I'll do my best to ask that. I don't know that that's tracked or not tracked. I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on running an apprenticeship program. Uh, the Department of Labor and Industry might track that information and have it readily available. I'm not sure. My, my request, Dan, was more about, uh, we used to at the last green line, what we did is we would say, uh, hey, you know, electricians, did anyone call you? Laborers, did anyone call you? Carpenters, did anyone call you? And it, it just held, I think, contractors more accountable on those pieces. Yeah. And I think, you know, some of the contractors do an excellent job and other ones, you know, they're bombing in these stats and the other ones are lifting up the, the project. The project does look good, but when you look at individually the contractors, it's like, who's who's calling your hall? And if people aren't calling your hall, that's a, that to me is an issue because that's where your first, second, third year apprentices are. You know, we can bring new people in all day long, but what about our folks who have done all the hard work, we've trained them, we've done our stuff. Our contractors calling them. That, yeah, that's and I can, I, you know, and you know every affiliate does uh, does everything differently, right? So some some affiliates have a strict hiring hall that can provide that information. Some affiliates have a referral hall. Some affiliates you solicit your own work. So some might, unions might not even be getting that information. I think Noah tried to answer that for the carpenters uh, what they'd seen. Um, Eric offered to look at that, get that information to you, and I can't remember what Derek said, but uh, yeah, we can absolutely. Uh, Bring that information if that's what we're asked to bring. And I'll just flag, I see Krista raising her actual hand, not the, not the virtual hand. So just making sure that that's seen so you have a chance to speak. If I could, that would be great. Just to support, you know, what both Noah and then Eric and Derek have said, you guys, 
and yeah, we're one of the car one of the the contractors that work very closely, you know, with our unions, and I always have. But the great thing is, you guys, is you think back to when I gave our slides of our entering and exit for last month. There were two individuals that were new um, hires to you know the LMJV, and what's great, and I'm going to give kudos kudos over to Noah. Um, I didn't need to call the hall or Mike or Todd, our individual our workforce leads, didn't need to call the hall because the carpenters um, had hosted a great career fair um, the previous month. And the month before that, there was the ninth annual MinCon crew. We actually got those two individuals through those events that the Carpenters Hall and Training Center was heavily involved with. Um, so we were able to take those individuals and sponsor them, you know, into their into the program and such. So it was kind of neat. So I just wanted to give the the unions support on sometimes, you know, you're going to see that we didn't, like I said, you know, I turned in our paperwork for good faith efforts the other day, and I didn't have any union call sheets to turn in that we're going to be doing moving forward and, you know, we're asking our subs to do the same. But what's great is these events that the halls, you know, that all the different training centers are heavily involved with sometime provide such success that the hall calls aren't needed. Um, yes, I know when we need the second, third year, you know, or skilled specified trade, you know, there's typically, there could be that call and such, but um, I just wanted to give the kudos to the halls that we work with. The other thing too is the the partnerships. When you guys ask about the partnerships, you know, and such, just remember um, building strong communities program, as well as some of the others like Goodwill and stuff, they do follow up with those contractors within that first year of that person's apprenticeship. There is partnerships there. And I talked earlier about it. The mentorship program that we have is direct communications with their representatives from the hall. So it's, it's, it's great. And I couldn't do my job without the relationships with the BAs, BRs, you know, and stuff, and with the apprenticeship coordinators and trainers at those halls. So thanks, you guys. Yeah, I, I just want to give Tyler an opportunity. I know you had his hand up for a while and put it down, but yes. Tyler. No, I appreciate it. So being uh, one of the, obviously at this point, newest, uh, but newer to walk in the room, and I'm still kind of, Getting my bearings on on who's who and, and how things and the historical piece of it, obviously, without having been a part of this group and this project up to this point. That's where I really appreciate all of you guys and your insight into the historics because it really helps me gain context to you know conversations that I hear circling around now and how it relates to the past and all that. So I really want to just thank you all for being so open um, to sharing those things with me. That's very helpful. Um, with that said, from an outsider's perspective, um, you know, what I see is that the, the couple things, um, the numbers that I look at, you know, on these reports and whatnot certainly paint a picture and that we have these goals that we are um, set trying to achieve um it's not in my mind necessarily about metrics i i'm looking at it and even not so much from a southwest light rail project scope my mind really starts looking at the what i'm hearing as the core kind of issues barriers things of of the gaps um, really more, in, from what I'm hearing, correlate to an industry and practice uh, pitfall more so than a Southwest LRT issue. Um, and, and what I'm wondering is what we are, what we have tried, so that historical context in there, looking to, to you all, have tried to kind of shift the, the natural trajectory, because from what I gather, you know, the word of mouth is the strongest kind of uh, button 
that gets pushed when it comes to who is entering the room over time. Um, so when I look then at industry practices and trends, as well as then if you want to factor in this project, this project to me represents huge opportunity to be able to change the narrative of standard trends. I mean, with the scope of work, the number of hours, the, the amount of labors that could go into it really provides unique opportunity to kind of insert that, that point of, of, of bridge um, to communities that up until, you know, recent maybe haven't had those doors open to them. Um, and could that be a way to propel what we already know as an effective strategy in terms of growth and pipeline feeding being that word of mouth, um, use that to kind of our advantage, I guess you could say. Um, I think that the, the bigger picture that, my, that I'm trying to wrap my head around how to tackle goes beyond the light rail. It's an industry. I think we may have lost your audio at the end there. Or were you ending with goes beyond the light rail? Yeah, I think we lost Tyler. Uh, John's got his hand up. Oh, no, Tyler's back. Go ahead, John. Okay. Yeah, I guess my I have two two questions. Um, one is regarding um, the subcontractors. So Krista mentioned submitting documents regarding calls to the union hall. And my question, or I guess trying to confirm is, um, is the prime contractors requiring their subcontractors to submit the same type of documents that they are submitting to MDHR as a way of making sure that their subcontractors are in compliance with the workforce uh, good faith efforts of calling the union halls? That's a short and sweet answer to your question, John. Yes. And I'm okay. working closely with Elaine regarding those each month. And Thank then, you. yep. And then the same thing would be going to Mike Tony, but uh, I would also add that um, what conversations have been taken place between the um, electricians' union halls since the systems contract works with a lot of electricians? And do we know if the electricians union hall has the diversity to be able to support the goals right now? Well, the short is, you know, uh, up to date, I don't believe any of our contractors have had to, had to reach out to the union halls. I don't think there's been any new hires with the amount of work that we've had over the last two years. I think we've had 4,000 hours over two years. Um, so that's not much. And so it's like one here, three here. It's just a day here, a week here. It's been it's been really sporadic, um, you know. And when we our subs and our and us when we call to call the union halls, you know, we're we're doing the best to have communications. We've had meetings with them. It was time to have meetings again. And uh, you know, as we build up in the spring, you know, I'm sure we'll be reaching out in in the springtime. I think for the work we have this year, the remainder of work for the three traction power substation foundations. That work is going to be very limited. Um, so, yeah, you know, we, we're in the spring. We'll be reaching out to the unions and, and probably this fall, and I'll see them in, in October, and we'll see what we can do. Can I give you guys some quick numbers on the, the civil contract? I can tell you last month we had 68 electricians on site. Out of those 68 electricians, 11, or wait, excuse me, I was counting the wrong one. Um, eight of those were female. And out of those eight, two of them were POCI. And then for the other, for POCI total, there were 12 POCI out of the 68 for last month alone. 
I hope that helps answer your question, John. Yeah, that is helpful. Dan? So and then we can wrap up this part of the, the yeah, end so, of Thank you. And I'm just going to ask maybe a dumb question, you know, but it's my first meeting, so hopefully I get the latitude to do that. But is there is there an equity plan for this project? Or is it just these are the goals, meet them? The no, there isn't, Dan. I'm sorry, Elaine, I didn't hear you. I said, no, there is no equity plan. So there's no plan, and we're wondering why we're not getting it, getting the job done. There isn't an equity plan, Dan, but each contractor has a work plan for the project that has been updated. Um, ours has been updated two times since I've been on the project, and I know our subs have plans that have been revised and updated also. And what's the work plan? I don't know what a work plan is. Can you explain what a work plan is? What's the workforce plan? participation plan? What are our plans, you know, to strive to meet the goals on the project? What are we committed to doing with the CBOs, with the unions? You know, what is the plan that was created, you know, during pre-construction and what revisions that have been made throughout the project now? And are those shared? Yeah, I'll with, share that with you, Dan. Yeah, are those shared? Oh, thank you, Krista. Are those can the contractors share those with their unions that so the unions Absolutely. can understand how to interact with that? Yes. But there's not but just to be clear, there's not an overall plan for the entire project. Each contractor is responsible for developing their own plan and implementing their own plan. Correct. And our plan includes um, participation with our the subcontractors. So the LMJV plan is pretty much a blanket plan for the project. Elaine can elaborate, my partner on this. I'm sorry, what am I elaborating on? The, that we have the work workforce participation plans for the project and how um, when you've requested updates and revisions, you know, or or just even updates on, hey, where we're at with different areas of it. Well, the last actual formal plan was submitted in August of, I want to say 2021 or 2020. Um, we have received from you, Krista, a more recent version but it ha it doesn't have um concrete um information on hours and um number of individuals that it, it it's more global uh discussing actions and activities that the um joint venture is going to engage in, but as far as the hiring, workforce uh, participation hours, that is not included in that, in the more recent updated version that's of the because, plan. Yeah, that's because we reported each month at both this meeting and at our good faith effort. You know, we, we talk about it, we discuss it, and we give that information. That's why the plan, has not been revised because it's a it's an active working piece with the meetings. So, but anyways, Dan, to answer your question, those can be shared. Definitely. Well, and, then, and and were the unions involved in helping to create them and understand what the what the well when they were is? first so created? Can... <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Dan. When they were first created, I can't speak for it because I was not there. Um, but I know I've had conversations and I'm trying to see if Eric is still online. Eric and I have had conversations. I know I've also had conversations um, with our cement nations, you know, with our trades that we're involved with, that the LMJB is involved with. Yes, those conversations have taken place. I would have to check with each of our subs regarding that, you know, but I would hope because of their... And it 
So it's yeah. a, but has the project office been involved in those plans or they just get them and, and say they got them and that, you know, is the project office been involved in helping develop these plans and right. sign off on them or is it just each contractor submits a plan and that's it? Well, when you talk about the project office, do you mean the LMJV project office? Oh, I mean the owner. Okay. The, the, the owner is the one that set the goals. The owner has a vested interest in seeing the goals be met. Yep. It sounds like the owner has offloaded that responsibility onto the joint venture to come up with it, who's probably put a plan together, but it doesn't sound to me, at least I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical, but like, I've never seen the plan. So right. I don't know if other affiliates have, but maybe that would be a way to question. restart this conversation and say, hey, what is their plan? And, you know. Right. So what I'm going to say, and I'm wondering, Dale is still online. Um, we have we have it. Um, we've reviewed it with, I mean, I know John Town, Ashante, Elaine, uh, Salima um, have seen it. And I actually think Scott has seen the work plan that the LMJV put together, um, which Dale was a very active, great supporting piece of it. I'm not sure of the level of sharing that has gone on after that. But I will also let you know, the great thing is I'd love to work with systems regarding theirs since theirs is getting ready to launch and ours is getting to ramp down. But what I will tell you, and I will update ours, uh oh, my battery's dying, um, is the fact that, um, and it was discussed at our last in-person meeting, which was awesome, is what can we do to leave a footprint from this project for moving forward to others because we have seriously two and a half years of construction left on the project. Um, and I know for our LMJV, some of our own self-performed work is ramping down. So, and I'm not saying that that's, that's stopping or that's giving, but what in, instead is what can we do like on the capital project, Construct Tomorrow and the MinCon crew, there's different things that we can create and establish or support current things like building strong communities, like Goodwill Easter Seals program. What can we do to support these programs moving forward? You know, for that footprint to ensure the continued growth of bringing people in and retaining them. You know, so I think it would be a great thing. Maybe at our September meeting, I would be more than happy to review the project work plan you know, with the people at the table. So. I think that would be awesome. Thanks, everybody. If that hasn't been happening, I think it that would be my ask that we make that a priority for our next meeting to make sure everybody understands what the plan is. I think that's great, Dan. Yeah. But I've been told we haven't had any, we don't have any public, um, or request for public participation so we can let this conversation go on a little bit longer. Um, I, I saw Mora had her hand up and then we can conclude it after that. I was actually just going to suggest the place that Dan and Krista left it, which is that this be on the agenda for the September meeting with everybody um, being able to see the plan and plan for our collective work moving forward in that context. All right. Well, thanks for that uh, discussion conversation. Um, again, I want to thank um, uh, our Building Strong Communities representatives and also our representatives from the IBW, um, carpenters and pile drivers and laborers. Appreciate your time and uh, taking the time to uh, with, with this committee. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, Ashanti. Thanks, everyone. Hi, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Appreciate everyone. the vigorous conversation. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.